can't see it. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what I picked up on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, okay. Our oh, fearful, fearful leader is here. So, <laughs> fear Hello. not. I come in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, yeah. uh, Douglas. Yes. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. And howdy, Ed. Call me, call me Doug, by the way. I, I okay. Right. Type uh, Douglas. So. Okay. You can call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I'll, I'll at least smirk at that. <laughs> I won't call you corny either. No, that's okay. You, you, you <laughs> feel perfectly free. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm one of those people that actually appreciates a, a decent amount of corn when it's properly served. <laughs> sure. <laughs> corn and beans. <laughs> Good for the heart. Yes, it is. Um, so, Douglas, did, are you Kentucky, Alabama, or Tennessee? I don't recall exactly. I know a southern U.S. state. I'm living in Frankfort, Kentucky. That's the uh, capital of Kentucky. Yeah. And, yeah, I've been here for five years. It's a, I think it's one of the smallest capitals in the U.S. Hmm. Not much going on. Saturday, one of, one Saturday, of the least Saturday. known as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spelled with an F O R T, not an F U R T. It looks like you have a nice music festival there. That is in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I I grew up. Um, the Big Ears Festival, I guess that's been going going on for um, past four or five years. It's been going pretty strong and steady. Uh, before that, it kind of was kind of hit and miss. I, I guess uh, the, the guy that puts it together felt it wasn't what he wanted, so they. Stopped for a few years. Mm. So, so uh, do you have family there still in Tennessee? Yeah, I'll be traveling uh, tomorrow to go visit them. My, my parents and my brother are about the extent of my family. Um, mm. My my mother's foster family lives in London, Kentucky, which is part of the Eastern Kentucky region, the Appalachian region. So it's it's a uh, interesting to say the least. I've, I've come to terms with that that lifestyle I, I'm immersed in it. I'm, I'm sort of a, uh, a single point with, with nothing <laughs> else around me <laughs> besides uh, Confederate flags. And um, there's, okay. there's a book by uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, it's a Republican politician called God's guns, grits and gravy. I think and yes. that kind of defines yes. what's going on around me uh, yes. to say the least, but like I said, I've come to term and, people they're great they're, they're people <laughs> they're people yeah. yeah 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 i grew up in western pennsylvania when uh obama was there in his last re-election campaign afterwards he had he he made a statement that western pennsylvania was all about god and guns and he, and he said it in a very sympathetic way because it is <laughs> uh, the first day of hunting season is a is a non-school day where I grew up, um, <laughs> and that's going to be on Monday, and they're all they're all taking off. And of course, he took a big big hit from the press about that. But the people there will tell you, well, well, that's what it is, and, and that's how they are. You know. So I have I agree admiration that you're able to find your way through that. I wasn't. I left. That's why I'm in Germany. <laughs> so, but but there are multiple layers to that reality too. Yes. There, yes. There's the media perception, the media. Yeah story that's created through news, opinion pieces, movies, music, etc., and the kind of perception that, you know, is culturally created or culturally mediated. And then there's the reality of just living someplace where, mm -hmm. you know, individual people and not just their, you know, portrayal or projections in, in the media. And individual people are a whole nother, you know, each person is their own universe basically yep. uh, and you know it, we they, they form cultural patterns so that the south has a kind of an atmosphere that's different than the north culturally speaking but they're not such distinct categories and um and also i mean as as you noted douglas in the forum and uh in the music that you shared actually uh Stur can you remind me of sturgeon simpson right sturgill Stur simpson yeah. sturgill i believe <laughs> never heard before and you know country music in my kind of prejudiced you know pre-reflective worldview is sort of like kind of low on the aesthetic you know preference scale mm -hmm. um but 
I think that like the sweetness and the intelligence and like everything that he brought into that song um, is like, and to, to, you can encounter that. And what I thought was so poignant about it is that you can encounter it anywhere and you can encounter it in the South and you can encounter it, you know, in Tennessee or Kentucky or anywhere else. I mean, that transcends those cultural divisions and those distinctions that, you know, are made between left and right, liberal, conservative, or even like, you know, as some will do developmentally between traditional worldviews, modern worldviews, postmodern, whatever. I mean, at some point you just step out, I think, of that whole mm-hmm. construction because um, it is a construction in a certain, you know, in a certain way. And you just look at what's in front of you, you know, like look at the actual relationships that you have and the actual context that you live in and try to make sense from that single point that, that you are um, rather than the cultural kind of framework that is, um, you know, promulgated uh, by the various, you know, conver- various forces that be. So in the anyway. sense, <laughs> is that um, what Slaughter Jack, however you pronounce his last name, is that his idea of a sphere or a bubble, maybe, in a sense? Or is that something, I, I think we should maybe stop right there before. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're not going to upset that's me. That's a great <laughs> question, actually. I think that's yeah, a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. And I would actually defer to Ed to, to answer <laughs> that. I, I read, I read um, I crit, there's a, author John Gray, who does book reviews. Um, he's, I think he's an English fellow. He did um, Straw Dogs, uh, The Soul of the Marionette. It's kind of kind of in the realm of um, we have no free will, so just live as the animals do, but not, not in that sense. But he's very critical. But he, I guess he's read everything by Slaughter Dyke, and he wrote a critical review of him um, that kind of at least summed up what his, he's all about, throwing in Heidegger and uh, that, that realm of thought. But um, yeah, of course, it sounds like it's all over the place. It's a massive... C- could thing, you repeat so. the name of the person that wrote that review? John Gray. Um, this is not the same one that, that you shared in the forum at the, at the outset of that reading, uh, Ed, is it? Because there, there are some real critical perspectives of Sloterdijk, I know. And Ed shared one just before we started reading Bubbles. And Ed kind of kept that flame alive of, of critique and sort of outside of kind of keeping a stance outside of Sloterdijk's um, uh, metaphorical, uh, you know, pre- pretenses, perhaps we might say. Or I mean, I'd let you explain yourself as you, as you would. But um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's a, I, I think the sphere concept has a lot of rele- relevance to what we're talking about because you know there are perhaps spheres of meaning or spheres of like cultural spheres that um it's hard to describe exactly what they are and that's part of the point of of Sloterdijk's work is like teasing about how, teasing apart how they really form because they're distributed right i mean but they're also local they're, they could be part of the south that's sort of a sphere like insofar as it's an identity and um, it uh, like constellates a world in which you can feel at home, right? And and, uh, and that's profound because I mean, part of the you know the political question here is like what's home for whom, right? Anyway, um, I'll Ed, I, I sort of very very crudely summarized your views, <laughs> and not even not even I wouldn't even summarize is too strong a word. But uh, is, that how, is that your understanding of spheres and like how? My, yeah, my, my problem with spheres all along was, was twofold. One of them was, is that they're exclusionary. Um, I, I understand that we need to do that sometimes, that we need to separate from what is from what is not and what we are and what we are not. That that's, that's very necessary at some times. I was a bit uh, put off by Slaughter Dykes uh, absolutizing that. Uh, the idea that this metaphor becomes like the dominant and predominant metaphor that we use in order to understand the, how those interactions and, and how our, our, our beingness takes place. Um, and and, and, and my, my negative reactions to that have to do, on the one hand, with the exclusionary nature, but on the other hand, 
the the let's say the static form, and this is something that we've been talking about a lot more in the meantime, um, that there's a, there's a dynamic in all of our interactions. There's a dynamic in all of the, in everything that we do. It's that, if I can um, go back to Arthur Young, it's that quantum of action that is determinant. So, so the moment there's action, the moment that there's movement there, and so the moment there's movement there, that which is static tends to take on a secondary importance. And in that regard, it simply becomes an analytical construct, it's something that I use in order to, not necessarily something that determines or defines. And since I'm, I'm very prone to favoring, and, I, and it is a prejudice that I have, I'm very prone to favoring things that are dynamic and moving. And that's why I'm very much in, in um, a, a, a Taurus fan, for example. I'm, I'm a big donut guy. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I, in, I brought in, a. I didn't have a donut to bring, but I, I did have yes. everything. <laughs> hey, bagels work for <laughs> <Yeah>. me. Believe me. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of the. It, and because they're, I, I find them. I, I had my tours here last week uh, <laughs> that I have on my shelf that I mm-hmm. use. Yeah, I watched the video. Did you watch the video? Okay, and because, and and it is that 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 dynamic. It is that movement. It is the fact that that. In in a in, a, in a, any kind of medium, that's the only form that can hold. That's it's it's a, a sustained shape, so to speak, or a sustained form. Um, and and I found it very interesting because you know Johnny uh, John had, uh, posted those um, uh, videos from uh, uh, William Brown, uh, which I which I also looked at, and I was just tickled by how often. He was into Tauruses and and how these these, the, these toroidal shapes and forms take place, and I understand and I appreciate John's love of the Klein bottle, but to me the Klein bottle is a you know it's a deri- deriva- derivation thereof. You just you take a piece off and stick it back in, and it does become something different, and it is something very powerful, and I think it is something very moving, moving, but it's not fundamental. I'm 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 still I'm at a point in my life. I think I've been there for a long time where I'm looking for the simplest possible explanation going. And, you know, I want, I want to sum up life in a half a sentence. <laughs> it's, a, it's an ideal goal that I'm going for. That's why, you know, to me, uh, that whole, the whole idea of, of you know, like loving your neighbor as yourself, that golden rule that appears in all world religions, it's very simple. It's very basic in the and when you get right down to it, it's kind of like sums them all up. The rest of it is kind of um, decoration. It's uh, expression. It's uh, I use a particular metaphor to describe it. I want it. It's kind of like commentary. It's it's like the old it's it's the old uh, Kabbalistic story of the uh, the guy who or actually it's in the Talmud. But the guy who wants to convert to Judaism and he tells Hillel, you know, explain the Torah to me and while standing on one leg, and he said. Uh, uh, don't do unto others what is hateful to yourself. The rest is commentary. Go study it. So he, he just reduces it to that one thing. And I figured, well, okay, well, that's a, actually a pretty good place to start. And the thing that I like about that particular metaphor is that it's non-exclusionary. You know, you have to engage with the others. You have to deal with the others. And and I'm the kind of person who, and this was obviously, uh, you know, John Gapeser has had a big influence on on my thinking. And one of the things that Gapeser points out is that, and his, his primary commentator, George uh, Georg Feuerstein, also brings out, is, you know, the whole purpose of existence, kind of like as Gapeser sees it or as Feuerstein expresses it, is, is, is transcending oneself. You always have to, to go after the more, whatever that might be. And, and, you know, and for me, I reduce that to, well, get over yourself. But the only way you can get over yourself is to figure out who you are. And then you can get over yourself. So, you know, we have to go through these processes. And, and this is where I see Slaughter Dyke. He says, okay, well, well, make a little bubble there and put yourself in it and see how things work. And I, I think that's okay. But I don't think it goes far enough. And I don't think it's, it's, um, it's what what he says that he wants to do. I think that's what he does, but I'm not sure that's what he says he wants to do. And that was our big discussion is what does he really mean and what does he really want to do? We don't know. So uh, that's why 
this non-movement spheres are, are static on the one hand and the fact, um, which is why I prefer the torus, because it is dynamic within in, in itself and something non-exclusionary ex because we do have to deal with everyone who is around us all the time. So any boundary I create to the other is always an artificial one. And I have to just keep that in mind that it is. So that's my, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. But that's just the curmudgeon view. No, it's it's um, right on. It's on point. Uh, it's how I see it. Uh, not to, if you have something to add, Marco, I'd, I'd like to hear that, but I, maybe how I define myself in, in half a sentence would be as kind of an undercover agent of some sort. <laughs> um, I, I, I am my bubble, but I, I don't know if he ever uses the metaphor of, at least slaughter jack, of, like, of when two bubbles collide, they of course become one. And there's no way to extract out of that. Um, I, I, maybe there is. I'm, I'm sure there is. But yeah, you can you can do that. If you enough soap or whatever, the, the bubbles will go back to separating. But kind of sounds um, like volume three. <laughs> maybe. Um, like I don't know anything about it, but that that's yeah. how I see myself in this world that I'm in. So I I want to. I, I posted right before this about my apolitical upbringing. My mm -hmm. a, a knowledge in a certain sense my parents are great but there was no creativity going on within the home other than my parents were loving and everything uh, just no intellectual intellectual stimulation and i've come into that recently i've, I've kind of read quite a few books but how do, one of our questions uh, the seed questions i think was uh, how do we basically apply science how do we apply this mm -hmm to the real world and um, I see it as I am an undercover agent in some sort of scientific way, combining myself with, with others who I would normally not mesh with. Um, mm -hmm. I'll stop there. I, uh, I, I doubt you weren't stimulated uh, <laughs> intellectually. As a, I mean, you may not, honestly, I'm saying that honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah something you needed. It is very harsh. Uh, uh, I, I, my parents, there's no, I don't think it's. Just, I don't think it's so harsh. I, 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 there, there were no. There are no books in my home other than mm -hmm. um, maybe the Bible, uh, which even that was not forced upon me in, in any sort of sense. But no, um, well, you didn't get that slapped around your head like I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, one. I mean, I doubt. Uh, maybe it's also that what you are. Um, identifying with intellectual stimulation is, and I'm just typing, I got a message from Johnny Davis. I'm yeah. just quickly um, replying to him because he's looking for the link to this. So um, let's hope he gets this. But now there's a, it says the post must be at least 20 characters. Oh no. All right. I just added in a bunch of junk text to yeah. make it 20 characters. <laughs> like Arbitrary confusing. rule. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I uh, I, I had an interesting, uh, I used to, uh, well, let me, let me back up. Um, I, I, first of all, my daughter's, my older daughter, who's eight, she's also an undercover agent <laughs> and she, um, <laughs> she, she, she commandeered our shed in the backyard and, and turned mm -hmm. it to her uh, hideout or her, her lair or uh, mm -hmm. office, her office, she created signs and, Mm -hmm. badges and hats and a trench she got a trench coat and sunglasses so um anyway just reminded me of that and it's kind of mm -hmm. it's delightful um uh, but it also occurs to me like how much of what we need is not intellectual and to, to ed's point um really is that that ethical or that moral foundation or the foundation of a positive example or a positive, I'm going to use the word sphere, <laughs> in, yeah. in, 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 in spheres of, uh, in our upbringing, um, is not to be underestimated. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, 
the cerebration, the intellectual proliferation of, of concepts and spheres, hyperspheres, non-Euclidean, trans-Euclidean, post-human uh, <laughs> configura- you know, configurations of reality c- actually do- can't make up for that, actually, I think. And, and that's why the traditional world traditional world or some kind of as arthur young puts it determinism like at the heart of like at, at, a, at a base foundational level of realities is really important because the deterministic aspect of it has um upscale like up upscale effects right on whatever develops on top of it so we could develop intellectually or mentally as dave sir points out in these incredibly pro- prolific and yet very deficient ways uh, and we constantly we, we because we don't have the integral connection to our own roots mm-hmm. which you know includes our environment the natural environment as well as the family environment and community and etc uh, we will spin more and more complexity without actually resolving the underlying deficiency and so uh uh, John has just um, appeared, Thanks. looking dashing. Mm-hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, John. Hi. And, and we had just got, we had just started talking. I don't, we didn't know. I was looking for out. the link. I couldn't find it. Sorry. It's been That's 15 okay. minutes looking all over. And you know how, if you're looking really hard for something, you can't. It you just can't see it. No, yeah, no way you're going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, somehow we we got to, we were talking about uh, Doug's upbringing in uh, in life in Kentucky and Tennessee. John, you also uh, were born raised in the South, Alabama, and, and then I was raised in, in Texas. Yeah, and, and then right, and then and so that got into kind of this cultural discussion about um, worldviews uh, about the Golden Rule. Uh, traditionalism, I'm just throwing out a few terms and just to kind of orient like where we are on the map. Um, and Doug, Doug brought in the concept of spheres. Like, mm. is this a sphere that I'm living in? And his own personal bubble, but bumping up against and for, combining with other bubbles. And so we, we didn't really define a direction for the conversation, but I think we began to um, clarify, well, I don't know, just mix, mingle our, 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 our respective uh, notions coming into this. And, uh, and Ed had reiterated his critique of Sluderdijk uh, and the bubble metaphor, uh, um, uh, offering instead the, the, the figure of the Taurus and the motion, the quantum of action that's implied by the Toriola figure. Uh, he sees that as even more fundamental than the Klein bottle because the Klein bottle is a twist on, on the Torah, so it can be derived from it. And so there's like I think the themes that we've been bringing up um, include like this sort of ethical, moral dimension, the do unto others, like the simplicity of of that th- those kinds of injunctions, um, and then the kind of proliferation of cultural and mediated complexity, different kinds of spheres. What Soderdijk goes on, you know, he talks about bubbles, but then that goes on in the second volume to globes, which are, you know, large scale cultural size bubbles, essentially, uh, like Western civilization is a kind of, you know, defined by globes of meaning, the, the, the order of um, the Christian you know, metaphysics, uh, which leads into the Enlightenment. And he, he traces that history in, in this book. But the third volume, which Ed referred to, is called Foams. And that's kind of what you were talking about, Doug, of all these separate bubbles bumping up against each other and forming this sort of amorphous blob is how I see it. And that's maybe where that, that his edge is and where we have to start to think beyond him because, yeah, the, the, a world of foam and of sort of uh, messiness uh, may not be what we want. We may want something more elegant more orderly more inspired uh and that may come through other visions other uh other narratives uh so with that i we might want to look at the questions that were posed on the topic for this because i think that those get at what we might 
want, you know, what we might be able to talk about. And Johnny, I also want to give you a chance to, yeah. to say I, hi. I didn't, get a, I didn't get a chance to read that. I've been running around all day. So mm-hmm. uh, there was a poem or something. It was oh, don't, yeah, don't worry about that. Um, Are there some guidelines to the discussion? Because I didn't get any of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ed, you guys, I think very you strong wiki, words on right? <laughs> you, you edited the wiki, right, Ed? I edited the wiki. It that. looks good. Would you like to, like, in, you know, introduce the seed questions that you posed and, you know, give some shape to this so that we don't well, just... Yeah, I, I, well, I, yeah, I could. Um, I, I'd like to just add one, one comment to, well, two, actually, to what you were saying. Um, one of the things that has struck me recently, my, my daughter, whom I'm living with, and we, you know, the grandson's in the house, and he's, he's two and a half years old, and he's a very strong-willed two and a half year old. It's not that he's just in his, in his, um, what do they call that? The terrible twos, they call it in, in, uh, in English and German. It's, it's called the, uh, Totsphase. And Tots is, is, is a, re- it's, it's more than resistance. Um, it's, it's stubborn resistance. So the Germans call it the stubborn resistance phase. And that, and that's what he's in. And he's, he is by nature, just a very strong world person every, every, anyway. And my daughter sits there and sometimes at dinner or right after dinner when he gets there and, and like, like most uh, overwrought mothers will sit there and go, well, well, what did I do to deserve this? Yeah. And I, and, and the thing that I, I keep telling her, um, she doesn't, <laughs> she don't, always, doesn't always like to hear, but I said, in life, we don't ever get what we deserve. We only ever get what we need. And this is what I heard you saying, Marco, when you were talking about, you know, these, the, our cultural backgrounds and where we are and, and who we grew up with. And, and this is, you know, reinforcing actually what Doug says. Um, I'm a big fan of in spite of. We learn in spite of school. We grow in spite of the obstacles that are put in our way. You know, we, we do a lot of things in spite of because – because we get, we do get them. I'm I'm one of those people that is is flaky enough to believe that, not that there's some cosmic karma, fate, whatever out there, but in in the way that we construct our world, and we all do that. This is also a point that we touched on. In bringing that up, we create conditions around ourselves that we have to deal with. We're we're comp- if we're not responsible we're at least complicit. And it, and it starts right at the very beginning. I know we all show up and we go, oh, how did I end up here? One of the biggest problems I have with, with patriotism, which is a, you know, a real strong metaphor these days, is how can you get all warm and fuzzy and emotional about, about an act of coincidence? You know, unless you believe that you chose to be born there, which means you have to believe in the preexistence of the soul and all that, stuff that occurs that you just ended up as an American or a German or an Iraqi or a Syrian or whatever. It's a, it's an accident. It's a, it's one of those rolls of the dice that uh, even Einstein was kind of reluctant to admit might be there, even though he didn't totally reject the fact that, well, maybe there is a little bit of a knocking around a cubes in a cup up there somewhere. <laughs> so, um, we we have to deal with the things that we have and we try to come to terms with those. And that was, and, and that's kind of that idea that's behind whatever those seed questions are. I don't think we need to go through them very specifically. The, the, the topics that I was, that I had in mind were, okay, well, what's come out of the discussions that we've been having? How, how is that maturing in any of us? What, what's, what's it actually, how is it moving us or not moving us? Um, not in the, in the sense that are we on the right path or whatnot, but just how are we reacting to that? How is this informing uh, what we're doing going forward? And, and I always have uh, John in the back of my mind. And, and, and what are you going to do with it in real life? What are you going to do with it when you walk out the front door? <laughs> because, <laughs> because it really doesn't matter what we all sit here and talk about. You know, the proof of the pudding's in the eating, and the, and the eating's out there. You know, we go out and we have to deal. What, how do we do that? And, and, and I know I scare lots of people off if I get too scientific and mathy, or I, can, I scare many more people off if I start getting a little esoteric in, in any regards, like things I just said now. 
that's uh, anathema to some some folks because they don't want to have to deal or think about, well, how did you end up being in the greatest country in the world? I, I have this problem, particularly with my uh, more conservative American friends, and I, I'm still on Facebook, and I still have a lot of them from Western Pennsylvania, and it's very clear where their sympathies lie. You know, so <laughs> um, not that I'm trying to to change their minds or overthrow that, but at least I'm always trying to prompt people to think about, well, why do you think what you think, and why do you believe what you believe? You know, and 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 that's and that's a very tricky thing to do. I I'm always overstepping my bounds. I'm always uh, I get too aggressive too quickly so that it puts people off or it, it, it turns them. Uh, antagonistic or whatnot, you know, that's why, that's why like, well, what do we do with this and how much is enough? And, 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 and what do we need to do to perhaps reinforce our own, you know, each other in, in doing those, you know, I can, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, that, that's a great question about the discussions that we've had this week and the previous week and um, what could be happening now. Um, I'm reminded of a friend of mine, she worked for Bill Gates, and uh, she was going to Africa quite a bit. And she, like myself, she was raised in the South. Um, I think she was from Mississippi, and I was born in Alabama, but I was raised in Texas. But I've lived here for 40 years in, in Manhattan. And she told me she goes to Africa, and she likes it there a lot. And I said, what is it about Africa you like so much? And she says, it reminds me of the South. And she's in, she has lived in New York as well, as long as I have. I, I sort of knew what she meant. Mm -hmm. There's a rhythm, a tempo rhythm, that yeah. it's part of a location. And when you leave it, you may be glad you left, or you may miss it somehow. Um, I know I live in the, you know, you've heard of the New York City Minute? Mm -hmm. That's my tempo rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm very aware of that when I listen to you guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> because y'all are so much more you're so much more civilized than we are here it's like it appears like come on get to the point you know i have to ask lady <laughs> so all my good manners that i that i learned in 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 the, in the south have sort of vanished i remember before my father died we had a conversation and he said he was we were on the phone he said son could you slow down you talk like a goddamn yankee Mm -hmm. I went, oh, okay, Dad. And I realized I had to start to remember my with my my drawl that I had in the South that I worked so hard to get rid of when I came to New York because I didn't want to appear, appear like a hick town boob or anything to these mm -hmm. kind of fancy New Yorkers. So I'm just saying that many of us are moving around the globe, mm -hmm. and we we, I mean, I got out of the South because I didn't like that rhythm. I didn't like the. I love the rhythm actually. I love the sound. But I didn't like what went with it, the behaviors that went with it, <laughs> like, like homophobia and the sexism and the racism and, and the deeply entrenched institutionalized uh, forms of it, which I thought, oh, New York, I'll be, I can escape from that. And to some extent, I did. So I'm just sharing this with you guys, because I think it's going to become more and more crucial as we start thinking about what we've learned or what we could learn about how we have many different tempo rhythms. Mm -hmm. And in each day that, that we have cycles, 24 hour cycles, we have uh, 90 minute cycles of rest and activity. We have those, those big, what they call those diurnal rhythms, you mm -hmm. know, um, monthly rhythms. So that's all happening. And we, and we, you know, every 24 hours we're moving in and out of these uh, brain waves. And I think that was what I've learned a lot from studying Carrie Welch mm. interview with, with Michael Garfield and um, her uh, taking the structures of Gebser and mapping them on to EEG and brainwaves. Because I'm, um, I'm very sensitive now. In just this one week, since having that model, playing with that model with you guys, um, how we can um, be more mindful of uh, which rhythm I'm in, which rhythm is getting interrupted, which rhythm, which rhythm would I prefer to be in? How can I, um, you know, 
go with the flow, but also change the flow. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when we bring these efficient forms of the archaic, the magical, the mythical, into the, um, into the, the mental. Because uh, it's, a, it's a very high beta energy here. Almost tw and 24 hours, 24 mm -hmm. seven, it, it's that way. So I do my meditation. I get up in the middle of the night and do my dream yoga. It's my practice. And it has to, and it's quiet usually. Most people have passed out or <laughs> gone to sleep. So that's when I can, I can enter into those slower, slower and more powerful kind of rhythms in a mental way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I think we can bring those, the healthy archaic and the mental can come together. And, and I think we must, enough, more of us have to start being able to yeah. register the effects of these different rhythms and start to modulate them. And um, anyway, I'm just throwing that out because I think this is a, an experiment actually, because we're in different time zones, different places, probably coming from different activities. We're going to be going to different activities later. And how can we um, really create, a, you know, a, a container, like a Petri dish, I think of it, you know, where we're experimenting. Um, because I really do cherish this time that we spend together and want to make, uh, make the most of it, um, you know, and letting my intentions be as transparent about my own intentions as possible. Because to me, I want more of a study. I probably am um, than a chat. I'm mm -hmm. sort of more interested in the seminar mm -hmm. attitude than I am in the cafe. But I also know you can do a little bit of both at the same time. I've had some of the best conversations in a cafe rather than in the classroom. Actually, most of my learning has happened in the cafeteria <laughs> rather than in the lecture hall. So I'm just sharing that with you guys and um, hoping it stimulates some response from you guys. Thank you very much. Just have a quick response about the, the Carrie Welch, I believe. Mm -hmm. Carrie Welch, yeah. Yeah, her, her, that talk was amazing as we've all picked up on. Um, I'm going to listen to it a third or fourth and fifth time and possibly uh, keep it on saved audio to have it disposal at any given time. Um, but one quote that resonated with me, uh, which was listed in the liner notes, um, the uh, host, I forget his name, but um, that he... Michael Garfield. Um, but one of the quotes was, children have to be indoctrinated, indoctrinated into time. Like they're not born into this linear time. They're born into a timeless space. And that's where they live. And then they live in a hypnagogic dream time, she said, which is all present moment. Um, so what's the right balance for this child, for, for any of us, but particularly, I, I, I found that amazing. I, I have a three-year-old. Um, and just, just simply trying to take him from his play area to the bathroom to brush his teeth uh, can take 30 minutes. <laughs> how, how do you do it so quickly? Don't, don't. <laughs> this is not a good thing. But but from from that thirty yeah. minute time period, he's not concerned about um, an hour from now we're going to the library to do a story time. That's his favorite thing in the world, or something like that. Um, he doesn't resonate with that. So I have already taken this into account. I'm saying lay off that, lay off your kid, Doug. Like just. Slow down a minute here, and as she was saying, you can tap into that. If, if we're somewhat in that integral realm, um, we can tap into those various um, spheres, for lack of a better word, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, and really be in that timelessness, in that state of flow, just able to move. And I've, uh, yeah, I, I've already utilize what she said as a practical application. And I love it. I hope I can dig deep into this. Um, and a quick other note, I'm, I'm really into dream yoga and even beyond that sleep yoga. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh, cool. It's, I love that my, stuff. <laughs> my main goal in life right now is to dig deep into 
a 41 day dark retreat. I don't know if you've heard wow, of that. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I want to do that. I just lifetimes away, but um, it's something that's profoundly amazing to me. Some people would say that's like solitary confinement and ruin their life. Oh, I'd love it. But, <laughs> but that's, that's where I'll cut it off there. I haven't arranged my schedule to do that, but uh, I would love to be able to do that. I think that's a very, um, I think that, um, I think that would be bringing in that because that was a practice established in Tibet, you know, up in the mountains. Um, and that's those monastic settings where you could really slow down and really connect to the, the, the powerful rhythms of the slow rhythms. I think, um, I think when we're living in, I, I think something else that I think Michael and um, Carrie pointed out was that the, the faster rhythms carry innovation and change and experiments. And the power is in those slower rhythms. So it's that exchange between those faster rhythms and the slower rhythms that produce change that's uh, substantial. Rather than up here, we, we fashions change every other day. But I think it's this, um, when we start to orchestrate these different rhythms, I, I believe we could expect something, a more eco ecological way of living than what we've got now, where we're constantly being distracted by these fashionable sort of, you know, what Trump tweeted today, <laughs> you know, which is pretty irrelevant, really. And how we can tap into, I think, that uh, long now. And um, I think that's what these dream yoga practices really cultivate, that long now. And how we can somehow be in both worlds at the same time. Um, I think my challenge is to bring that into my waking life so that this waking world could be a, a lucid waking world rather than just cultivate lucid dreams. Um, I can bring that into, and I can take that back into a lucid, lucid dream. So I think this is a, these are the kinds of uh, different kinds of freedom and constraints that are being opened up. Anyway, I got much more to say about this, but I'd like to, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to interrupt the flow here. Other people might have some, something to contribute that, you know, we could all benefit from because, um, I have a desired outcome and it's really very uh, about modeling. Uh, Carrie Welch, William Brown, and Arthur Young. I want to look at their models, do a con you know, a comparison. Um, because I think they, all three of these theorists are pointing out certain features that I think can be teased apart and brought back together in interesting ways. And ultimately what I'd like to do, I've already mentioned this to William Brown about doing a modeling pro project with him. You know, I'd like to bring together William Brown, Carrie Welch, sure. and, and get everyone on the same page because mm -hmm. I think this is, this is the future. I think these two, I think uh, Mr. Young, of course, has transitioned already. Um, but Carrie and Carrie Welch and Michael Garfield and um, certainly w William Brown, they are, I think, um, the future. I think they're very future oriented and have very different notions. I think of, uh, I think they could, we could update what they're going through now with uh, what um, Mr. Young went through and what he developed. Um, because I think there are considerable overlaps. And in a way, I think that Brown and Kerry Welch are uh, the future, really, of, uh, of Arthur Young's model, this reflexive uh, universe. Anyway, that's a big, big desired outcome that I have. And I, I'm not expecting anybody here to, to, to join with me in this. Because <laughs> it's pretty crazy. <laughs> but, you know, why not? You know, why not? We have this technology. Get off everybody before, John. Uh, yeah, we, we have this beautiful technology, and I think we're, we're setting down some tracks here so that we can actually use it in ways that are not manipulated by nefarious forces. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I think if, if we could start to focus our attention on what we want to have happen, we can then maybe start to uh, stimulate a search. And that's going to be different for each person on this call or, you know, whoever's listening to this call. When, so, when you I, say we, do you mean just we here or? I mean the royal we. Where's my crown? <laughs> uh, just a quick comment, and I, I don't want to say much else, but I typically don't talk, but you guys inspire me to talk. But, please uh, do. Please, yeah. please stop. The, me. <laughs> this, this wave of, so I see the anti version of this as the, the sexual harassment. Like, this is a great thing that so much is coming out. But it's it's newsworthy because it's negative. It's because it's media worthy. Yeah. Um, but what you're talking about is not just two or three fractal intelligent people, Brown and Welsh, and but start a, a quick movement of maybe ten people, and then they reach out to ten billion people, and it becomes that sort of movement in that direction. And so, how do we do that? How do we go from um, what I mentioned before to more positive sense of not necessarily extracting all the knowledge possible in every realm, but to go down one path that leads us in the right direction and just go with it to alleviate people. Like this sexual harassment thing is liberating quite a few women and possibly even men. I think so. Um, but I think, I think it's a very important, um, it's, I think something significant is happening. Uh, I think uh, we're, a lot of toxins in the system are getting flushed out. That's my read. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's maybe a, it may be excessive, or, or the purging may be happening too fast, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and there may be a backlash. I, I think I, we should expect one. Because um, the predator prey, you're either yeah. one or the other, I find very suspicious. Um, and I know there's a lot of collusion going on. And uh, I think that's coming out too. So it's, it's, it's significant, I think. Um, but I think that's a very interesting direction to go in. Um, how, I think this is a big challenge is how can we direct our attention to what our intentions are? Um, it's so easy for me to get swept away in the drama of the day, you know, and lose track. And I think this is why I, I like the Kerry Welch, uh, Michael Garfield also mentioned the long now. I can't remember the theorist he was talking about, but I, I looked him up and he said, some, it's very simple actually, there's, there's, um, um, what is it? I just wrote it down. Brand? It's yeah. yesterday, there's yesterday, today, tomorrow, there's last decade, this decade, future decade. There's 2,000 years ago. There's 2,000 years from now. That's the long now. But the, at, we're working, I think, in the meso level, the human. Um, I think the micro and the macro and the meso would be fluid. And I think that this, what I'm reading about Jung today was very interesting because he's talking about these, these laws and our individual changes that we make. And there's, I think this, Lee Smolin, a physicist, he's written a lot about time too. I'm very interested in models of time, but he's talking about um, the laws themselves. Where do the laws come from? And the laws can change. And uh, so it, it, that complexifies things quite a bit. So, and I think all these, the, the, the stuff about the sexual harassment and, and it's been going on for a couple of weeks and it's gotten quite a bit of momentum going. I think these are the kinds of trends to watch rather than, you know, the tweet of the day from, from Donald Trump. <clears throat> so, so I think it's how do we determine or how do we decide what's, the trend that we want to pay attention to. Um, that's very tricky. And what I love about our conversations this week uh, online is um, 
as I shared some of the videos that, that got my attention, William Brown and Carrie Welch, and, and some of you responded to that, then I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm not so alone that I find this interesting. And, and others in this group are finding that interesting. Um, maybe there we, we could start finding a direction that's uh, useful for each of us and all of us. Because uh, I think I expressed my frustration in the last call about this postmodern drift, which is so prevalent in our culture. Mm -hmm. I would come up with a, have a eureka, don't do anything with it, and nothing happens. But how do we ground those eurekas, amplify them, start getting feedback? And um, I posted a model on serendipity, a perceptual model for serendipity, a friend of mine developed. But I, I've been using that, and uh, it's definitely helped me. And so, I, it, you know, if I, if I find a model, or any of you guys find a model that really works for you, please share it with us. You know, let's you know put it on the table and start to use it, like a, a rehearse with it, and get to see if you get any results. And if you do, amplify that. You know. So anyway, guys, thank you. <laughs> I have a few things I could mm -hmm. offer uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to tie a number of threads together. One is the notion of doing something with. You're very good at that, by the way, Marco. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say that's, that's a wanted, I did, yeah, I want to, yeah, you're a very good summarizer. Yeah, yeah. I'll try. <laughs> it doesn't feel <laughs> subjectively <laughs> like I'm very good. It feels like I'm really just pulling together. Uh, strands and yeah. I'm trying to do keep doing that, um, but um, <laughs> keep, that up. keep that up. Keep that up. <laughs> and you saw this well, it was interesting because you saw this happening within Michael's conversation with Carrie. Is you they got really to the edges of where they could articulate, and mm -hmm. and you know be, you get to those places where you have some insights, and insights are in in the air. They're kind of on the table, um, and you have maybe the pieces of models, pieces of puzzles that could go together or not. You don't see exactly how they connect, but somehow you know that they connect. And there's an incompleteness, and in, even in your ability to articulate what it is that you're thinking. But you've already taken the thought so far. So that's a very pregnant space. And I, and I, I, I noticed a couple of things there that I, I want to refer back to. Uh, but before that, to bring in the point of, the, the sort of human level point of how um, we bring whatever is learned from these conversations into our day-to-day -day -day life, the ethical dimension of that, and, and the sort of ability to root that, to ground that in a deep time, long now, and closer to traditional perspective in the sense that the traditional world is slower. And it doesn't have the high beta, hyper intellectual, hyper technological kinds of qualities. And then how that ties to parenting, <laughs> because I'm also a parent of young kids. And what you described, uh, Doug, about the 30 minute journey, like <laughs> <laughs> the ordeal that the simplest acts can be <laughs> when you know, working with disparate time horizons. Um, that is one of them, I think, the defining features of growing up is growing through different time, growing into different time horizons. And that's um, part of what Michael and um, Carrie were talking about as far as the you know, mapping the states of consciousness to they kind of mix together states, stages of development and then a more Gibsarian view of structures that arise and can be correlated. And there's um, you know, that model of a, a sort of unfolding from delta to theta to alpha to beta, and then beyond that, gamma, but then also the, the ability to transit between the states, to cycle through them with some lucidity. Like, that's a model that has time in, in it. It has a sort of developmental aspect in it, has cultural ramifications in it. And um, so I think we could look at how that model is structured and where the real um, maybe uh, jagged edges are, the places where they don't quite quite connect up. 
um, particularly when we were talking about development, d- developmentalism or evolution, uh, and the notion that something comes after and maybe is better than what came before. But what when what comes? But the fact also that what comes after could also dissociate from what came before, uh, and so it actually creates a situation that's not necessarily overall better. Uh, or we could argue about that. But when we get to that place or that zone that we've we've recognized the however you want to con- various conceptions of stages, time waves, um, growing up waking up uh, and what comes next, like what's the future? Uh, I think there it could be helpful to, um, to make some, some theoretical distinctions. Uh, and this is where I thought, like if I were just to enter into the critical mode, put on my critic's hat, which I won't stick to. I like the visionary and the realist as well. But um, one, one, um, one theoretical distinction that I think we could maybe tease out from Michael and Kerry's talk is the notion of timelessness. And this is coming right from Gebser. So this is me applying Gebser's model of how time unfolds from a timelessness to various structures of time to the a- achronon or time free. So there's a distinction between timelessness, which is the kind of primordial basic archaic state, and then the time free, which in his model presupposes the other structures having emerged. In other words, presupposes archaic, magic, <laughs> mythic, and mental. So the time free that Gabeser describes kind of as the integral or the aperspectival is not the same as the timelessness of the child, but you can be in touch with it. And I think it's important to make that distinction because it's, it, it may be a regression, but ultimately it is a transcendence that includes or recurs. It's recursive. It's a recursive transcendence that includes those enfolded and unfolding structures and states. So I, 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 I would ask you, Ed, to maybe ref, reflect on that part in particular, because you're much more the Gebster scholar than I, than I am, but I thought that that was one clarification that maybe could help better define what the integral is mm-hmm. and why the integral is not just the next level. It's not just gamma. And, and mm-hmm. I noted that Kerry didn't equate yeah. the integral with gamma. Because gamma it would be the next highest frequency of, of brainwave state. And it's associated actually with, uh, in meditators, long-term meditators, it's associated with compassion. It's associated with um, very lucid awake, wakefulness. Uh, and it's a bit different than the uh, delta states, you know, that are more, let's say, intro, in, introverted, introspective, dark uh, so there's some really interesting things going on there. And uh, I think we could, I, mean, I think it'd be fruitful actually to, to tease them apart. Yeah, that was one of the, the quotes from you from the, the forum that you said about not equating the integral with gamma that I mm-hmm. kind of wanted you guys to discuss. Because uh, mm-hmm. the, the integral isn't better. Yeah, that's, that's the point, John. I think you hit the nail right on the head there. It's not... I, I was watching something else this afternoon. It was, um, it, it, it's about kind of like our new consciousness and the primacy of consciousness. It's called, it was called the physics of the soul. That's why I looked at it because it, just from the title, it related very much to what, what it is that we were talking about. And, and, and over an hour and a half, the, the thing that I disliked about the, the documentary was that there was too much resonance, harmony, and everything is going to be wonderful once once we get there. <laughs> and, and 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 as much as I wish it were that way, and as much as I I would like to hope that one day it might be that way, I just fundamentally here comes the curmudgeon again. I I just don't believe it. I'm kind of like um, William Brown. I really appreciated that one point of his his talk where he goes. Well, but I don't really think it's going to happen that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not as optimistic about that as everyone else. <laughs> you know, yeah. especially when you're dealing with that. He was talking about orders of magnitude of energy that are just universe annihilating when you get right down to it, if I can phrase it that way. And so, and, and I've always 
I've always had more of a Kabbalistic uh, tendency in my life, and 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 one of the one of the adages in, in uh, Kabbalah that, that comes out very early if you delve into it very deeply is that if you're going to be enlightened, you've got to do it in this world, in this one, and it's the one with the kids and the job and the everyday and the whatnot and the aggravation. That's where it happens. If you don't do it there, you're not. As they like to say, you're just not going to get it. Okay, so <laughs> you can go off to the bed or you can go off to the, you know, and that's going to be helpful. But in the end, you've got to, and this is why a partially of the prompting of the seat questions, you have to bring it back here and take it out into your front yard. You have to deal with the neighbor. You have to get on. I have to get see the burgum, you know, the mayor here every once in a while, which is just a, an inordinate pleasure for me. Um, he, he thinks very highly of me. I can't stand the guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we have our own way of, you know, interacting with each other because, because that's where you actually have to do it in the end. And, and one of the things that I appreciated greatly about, you know, the Kerry Welch and the uh, Michael Garfield interview was, I, and I think you're right, Marco, this is this, this point, you know, Time being time free or time freedom, the you know however it's pronounced the acronym, it's it's qualitatively intensely different than timelessness, okay? Because it's a timelessness you you can take somewhere, you know the timelessness of the, of the magical structure is there. It's you experience it. My grandson's not going to go anywhere with it. He's got it. It's just there. I have to deal with it. He's not dealing with it. I am. But, but there are, when I see that and when I'm experiencing that, I, I know this is a phase. He's, he's going to get through this, over it, and I hope that I can contribute that he will be a better person for it, of going through it and getting over it. And that when he gets to the point where he realizes, oh, uh, I do have a, a, lot, a clock and I do have to be here and I do have to do these kinds of things that he's not going to resent that I had to get him over it that way or however that is. Because, and that was the point that Kerry brought out that I, one of the little phrases in there, part of what this integral perception or apperception or understanding or incorporation of time in the integral is the sub an awareness of the subjective nature of our experience of time. That it, at, certain, so at some points, we simply, we just, we feel it's that way. It doesn't mean it's that way. We have to be aware that we're feeling that it's that. That's our feeling at the time. I can't tell you, since I retired, I have not had a moment's free time. You know, you either have nothing to do or you have no time. That's the story of a retire. Get ready, John. It's coming around the corner for you. You know, and it's because and 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 it's impossible to deal with. Well, I have to go through it every day, so obviously I'm dealing with it, but but it's impossible to deal with. I I I never thought I'd say it, but I miss having to get up. I got up at a four at a four o'clock in the morning for 40 years. So that I could get to work, so I could do my job. I had an hour and a half commute when I was when I came back here to Germany, and there are days I miss that <laughs> because because I was so much more in control of my time that I have absolutely no control over now because everything else determines how I how I deal with my time. So I find myself, um, and and I'm not. Um, ungrateful for it because it's stimul it's been stimulating me creative creatively i have to figure out ways to do stuff quicker than i used to have to do them before and it's not an analytical process of sitting down and say well i could take six seconds off of here or nine seconds off it's not that at all it's really about the experience i have of the time that i'm engaging in. that's why i i would have been very unhappy if we hadn't been able to get together this evening it's time for me. These this is always time well spent, even if it doesn't appear at the beginning that we're actually talking about something very important. We always end up talking about something that's absolutely essential, at least from my perspective and what I'm doing on how I'm going to go about and deal with the world. 
because I always want to make sure that I can get it out and take this into the world. So I think a lot about what you know goes on in the discussions, but also when we have these conversations in the evening. So so this this whole idea, because that was the thing that fascinated me out the most about Gapeser, and it's why I harp on it all the time. I think you can't talk about any of this stuff, consciousness or otherwise, without at least acknowledging that there is a time component that must be dealt with and that it has an extremely um, um, intense effect on how we deal with everything else. You know, that, and, and I had mentioned that in our slide. I just got, that bothered me. That bothers me about Peter is he never mentions it. He like, he ignores it. I mean, you ignore things you don't want to deal with. Um, okay. Well, that's fine. But you also know, I, but I also find that we can use spheres to describe things a lot of time. But these spheres move through time, you know. So how do we how do we temporalize the spatial? That's one of the themes that comes up in Dake and in, in, in Gapeser a lot, because we've already spatialized the temporal with our arrow that we absolutely need, or everything happens at once. So that to me is an, an extremely important, important aspect of this. And that's why I appreciated very much that she did bring in the fact that we actually go through these rhythms every day right? and, and getting a better understanding of the difference between evolutionary developmental and, and, and simply phasal. You know, that was the thing I liked about, about Arthur Young where everybody's head hurt in the appendix when Eddington starts talking about, Oh, well the phase is actually how you deal with time. The more I think about it, the more my head hurts, but the more I think, well, I think he's onto something here because it is, it, there's a phase aspect of this. You know, when do we get into, when are we, you know, when am I getting things done? There's days I go to bed and I'm going, man, I was really in the classic sense of the word productive today. I didn't do a thing <laughs> except got dinner on the table. The kid was in kindergarten at the right time i got him picked up and didn't forget him and you know anything else that i was and the shopping was done you know but so i think you know th th these are things uh, that you brought up marco that are that are that work well and need to be incorporated into this modeling process that you know that john keeps talking about and to me that's not it's not about finding a technique to do something that, that's another thing that i hear a lot about oh well if you just sit down and do this i think dream yoga is probably a brilliant thing I don't know if I am or can or would or wouldn't, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Okay. And if I did, what difference would it make? You know, because I'm, ne I've never been a person that's looked for a, well, I'll get a technique and then I'll be able to do this better. Uh, I'll be more efficient with Excel. And so the only reason I ever wanted to be efficient with Excel was so that my boss got off my back. And when I found a way to do that, my interest in Excel went to zero, you know, until the next thing came up, that kind of thing. So I'm not looking for the techniques. I'm looking for that, the principle, let's call it, call it that, that I, can, that I can drag along. And a lot of times modeling helps point to those, points to those principles that will get us somewhere. <clears throat> right. I don't think we can, um, th theories are easy. Modeling is hard. It's harder, yeah, it's a lot harder. And the theories come out of, out of effective models. So when I hear people talking about their theory, I say, great, that's lovely. What's your model? And very often they don't have one. So that's where I feel like, okay. And modeling is a high level skill, just as lucid dreaming or dream yoga is. And it's not for everybody. But then, you know, I can't run, you know, people can dance and run and hit a high C. I can't do that. <laughs> You know, so we all have our we all have our gifts and our limitations, <laughs> and I think um, I we've learned a lot, and we also have to, as we get older, unlearn even more. And I, uh, as some of you have children and raised children, I've taken care of children on occasion, but I don't have any kids. Um, but I have taken care of the elderly. And this is something um, Michael brought in, mm -hmm. how important it is to hang out with old people yeah. and with rocks and trees, you know, to catch, to catch that, um, that long now. And um, 
a, a very different, I took care of her. I was employed by her. She was my employer um, or her family employed me to, to take care of her um, for the last five years of her life. I was basically the, the person everyone turned to to say, how's she doing? Mm-hmm. So she, and she didn't remember, and she was losing everything, really. I mean, her mind was going. Her, her autobiographical memory was going, but the episodic memory was still there. She could, I took her dancing twice a week. She was a ballroom dancer. She could do the foxtrot. She, she could do the waltz. You know? <laughs> she could do the tango. Mm-hmm. And she was a very, very fashionable lady. She was beautifully dressed. She was a very wealthy woman, came from a very uh, a self-made person. And she, w- she did very well in, in the business world. So, but I had that poignant role to play as she was dropping all of these, sh- these memories. I could see all these, uh, these things that she learned, the gimmicks she learned, the, the su- subterfuges she would employ. And she projected all kinds of things onto me. Um, you know, I remember poignantly, as I knew she was starting to lose it, she said, um, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. She says, she says, how old am I? I said, uh, you're 94. And she went, oh, God. And then she asked me, she says, and uh, can I ask you another question? I said, sure. She says, are we married? I said, no, sweetheart, we're not married. Um, but I take care of you. And I'm just... And I found myself over the years falling totally in love with this person. I've loved, I love her. Mm -hmm. My heart just opened. So there's a deep, so I, but I, you know, I found all those missing pieces in myself and all the missing pieces in her. We somehow found a way of working together. And people were wondering, like, wow, she's so, she's functioning so well when you're around, but when do, when you're not there, she just falls apart. <clears throat> so I felt this a uh, deep responsibility, just as you would with a little child. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, but every morning when I got up and went went to the place where she lived, I looked forward to every day. It was just the best job I ever had, and I just I'm just wondering about this mystery, you know, uh, of this um as we start to drop all this stuff, all the accumulated things we learned, how to get by, how to make it in this, you know, this dog eat dog world. <clears throat> and then, then uh, you know, if we live long enough, we're gonna have to start dropping that stuff. And uh, we have to unlearn a lot of that. And all of our gimmicks, you know, the things that we learned how to, how to be, you know, make it. I think that's a big challenge and I'm starting to realize it too. Um, but I always loved them be when she got together with little kids, she would just like, wow, this little kid, she just loved that little kid. And I thought that's something that also Carrie Welch mentioned how the, 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 when the grandparents and the, and the little grandchildren get together, I mean, the, the babies are coming out of that and the, mm-hmm. the grandparents and the great grandparents are getting ready to go into that same mm-hmm. long now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's uh, so important as our cultures start to as we start to mature we have to ask ourselves well what in the world is mature especially for men I think men are more challenged than women are and that may be sexist of me to say but uh, or we have different challenges but I think there's so many really bad um, really bad men do really well mm. in this society and a lot of really good men you know they're penalized almost. Mm-hmm. So what could be, what could a mature, a masculine, um, be like? I'm not quite sure. I think the short little video from uh, Moonlight that he posted that, that really touched me. But the the underlying model from mm-hmm. the the book. The four archetypes that whatever whoever wrote that. Gillette book. and Moore, yeah. Mm-hmm. The four I, masculine. I feel, I feel that's a great formula there for developing your inner man. Yeah. So and um, yeah, living living here in Kentucky in the South, uh, the man here is almost pathetic in a certain sense. There's so much drug use 
uh, in the negative sense of that and just just no no true masculinity there other than guns grits and gravy those mm-hmm. those type of things and that's it's really not much going on for the male here and mm-hmm. I, I have people i talk uh, women trying to date these men and they're they're pathetic they they live with their mothers they um, they which that's not pathetic in a sense but mm-hmm. they they have nothing going for them due to the society that they live in and they're they're the next group of um, in, this, in a sense they're almost a minority in, in that mentality of um, a black person a homosexual just mm-hmm. they, they're they see themselves as marginalized and they don't know where to go. What's the age range? Are they, are these young people or middle-aged? Uh, or is it um, all over the map? Uh, Douglas? I'm, I, I'm no expert, but um, I've picked up on from age 20, 20 something to even forties, fifties. Uh-huh. No hope, no mm. the pathetic. Uh, they see themselves as pathetic and, externalized that is something that is um brings out the more aggressive male i think that's what margaret archer would call the 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 fragmented that there's uh there's meta reflexives i think people like us who can be critical critical thinkers critical of the church and the state and and we can also find a way to make it somehow um, we can create strategies somehow to, to work with it. But, and we can reflect on our own behavior and figure out what's the most useful thing for me to be doing. But there are some people who aren't able to do that. And they're, they're breaking down. And they're not finding any opportunities. They're just breaking down. And I think that's a, that's a huge stressor right now. I don't know what the long view of this is, but right now I just see... Um, uh, just a lot of hype, a lot of hyper behavior, a lot of distractions, you know, with their devices or low level trances in front of the TV set, you know, which is not the same kind of trances when you're doing dream work. You know, those are altered states also, but they're very disciplined altered states. Uh, but I think it takes a certain kind of capacity to, to hold that um, those different kinds of realities. Um, it's a big challenge. So no, thank think, you for sharing that, Doug. I, I, I think one of the things you bring up a lot, John, is that, um, and, and this is what I hear Doug saying, um, we're, we're really good at doing the deficient part of the structures. And, we're, and, and we practice it a lot. Yeah. So when they're in the trance, you know, the couch potato is magical, but it's not, yeah, it's not, the efficient magic. It's not efficient myth, the stories that they're putting together, that whole patriarchy, you know, what they've, what they were raised to believe is the truth of reality is unraveling before their own eyes. You know, I, I, I really feel bad for, for these people because everything you believe in, and, and, and we, we find this, this is one of the reasons for John that, you know, you, you will often, as you've noted, Bring up, bring up um, a psi experience of some sort. Talk, talk just briefly in passing about some precognition you might have had, and eyes get big, jaws drop, people take steps back from you, right in the middle of a conversation where it's absolutely harmless. You know? <laughs> and because at that moment, they realize that everything that they've been taught to believe can be questioned and may be questionable. That, and it's not just that it can be questioned. I think a lot of people can deal with that part of it, but it becomes questionable. What if he's right? You know, e- even the suspicion that you might be right is enough to to throw people off balance, and and that brings up all you know, raises all the hackles, brings up the guard, causes aggression, um, and and we males are particularly susceptible to that. You know, we 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 have an added burden that we have to. Yeah acknowledge that we do it's testosterone <laughs> yeah it is but you know i find it interesting um since since i do a lot with you know kabbalah 
one of the interesting things that there's 619 commandments in the Old Testament that Orthodox Jews have to follow. One for every bone in the body. Okay? <laughs> but what's interesting is only men are bound by these 619 commandments. Women only have to obey 248 of them. Wow. They're fr- yes. <laughs> because <laughs> you'd never believe this by thinking it, but because women have a, a more direct line to God than men do. Mm-hmm. They, they're they by nature more spiritual and more in tune than men are. Just so happens that the number 248 is the geom- geomatria, the, the numeration of the Hebrew letters that spells the word womb, okay? Mm-hmm. Just to add on top of it. But one of the things I find fascinating is that women are not bound by any commen- commandments that are time-based other than the Sabbath. Mm. They're they're like considered, I'll put it in Gabesarian terms, time free because mm. of their spiritual inc- <laughs> inclination. And so I, I I find a lot of inspiration in that, saying, well, even though it's buried very deeply in a very patriarchal structured society and, and religion for the most part, there are these 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 elements in there that that points to things that that we're talking about all the time, and we see that that they can have very detrimental and devastating effects, not on the people involved, but also on our environment and the, and the, and the world around us. You know, we threaten someone's basic assumptions. Why is it that, that so many mainstream science, Daniel Dennett, why does Daniel Dennett get rabid when, when you question his statement that consciousness is an illusion? You know, why does, why does, um, Dawkins go off the deep end if you say, well, a selfish meme is actually a metaphysical construct. Well, because you've, you've put your finger right in the wound. They, they've come to the limit of what they can, and now you've questioned their worldview. And doing it even innocuously, uh, not threateningly, is too much because now I have to deal with that, and I don't want to deal with the foundations of my belief in the world. And, and those foundations are strong. And they're very well intentioned, and, and and we have to be careful about doing that. That's why, you know, when we're reading, whomever we're reading, and I'm suggesting we well, let's look at their original priests' suppositions, the assumptions. What are they basing this on? What are their beliefs? Beliefs are extremely powerful movers, and we all have them, but we all don't know what our beliefs are. And 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 so one of the things that I try to help people to do without them knowing it. Is, is we'll find out what your beliefs are. It, it doesn't matter. Just know it. Just, you know, just be aware of what they are. So you you're an like, undercover agent too? You there you go. See? <laughs> <laughs> I was in military intelligence when I was in the Army. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to have to leave soon. So I, I've had a great time here. I, I want to kind of throw something out because you mentioned um, Dawkins and his, yeah. his buddy Dennett. Um, I'm really interested in the direction Sam Harris is going. I don't know if you follow his podcast. Um, I don't follow him. I, or I at least it. listen, but there was an episode where he talked with uh, Metzinger. Uh, I can't remember his first name. You might know um, mm-hmm. Marco. But um, near the end of it, which I think it's episode 91, I, I really think you should check this segment out. Episode 91. I'll post it later, maybe. Uh, That'd be nice. At an hour and 48 minutes, I, I had to go back and listen to it and kind of quote it. But he he's heading in the right direction, I feel. Um, and it, recently he's kind of said, I, I was never in the new atheist movement. I, I've always been on the spiritual side. And I, I you know, how he, I, I despise his books in a certain sense. I, I just can't read them because they're so... Not not how he talks. Um, okay. uh, well, he, if, if you listen to past Harris versus recent uh, Harris, maybe uh, um, he he's really starting to articulate himself. Uh, okay. Uh, right. The psychology of Sam Harris is is changing. Uh, oh. But this this quote from um, the end of that podcast is. Uh, let me see if I can. So he says clearly, what we need is a spiritual and ethical worldview a methodology to put in place of all the indefensible versions that have come to us courtesy of religion, 
So, so far it sounds like typical stuff, but mm. uh, it has to be embraced in the spirit of science and logical and empirical rigor. But clearly there is more to the story than just understanding the brain and the mind in third person terms. We have to figure out what we mean by a life worth living, what the horizons of the well-being of conscious creatures actually encompass, how good it is possible to feel personally and collectively as a human being given our circumstances, and how do we build a civilization that maximizes for the flourishing of conscious creatures like ourselves. Um, and it goes on to say, but I suspect that it is possible that our navigation of the space of possible experiences or more open-ended. Uh, we just have to figure out how to navigate the landscape of mind or possible minds where it is possible to suffer excruciating and pointless misery for a very long time, and it's possible to move as far away from that as we can conceive in the spaces of just purely creative, aesthetically beautiful, intellectually rewarding contact with the cosmos, both within us and without us, and whether we can... But this is kind of where he goes, and whether we can drag animals and other species along with us is, um, he's skeptical, but, um, this was, who was this? Sam Harris. Harris. Sam Harris, yeah. He sounds but, like he's making progress, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was saying when you left the door. I was thinking the same thing, John. Yeah, you need to But better late than never, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but better than really. <laughs> I don't want to throw out any more references to books that I really wanted to throw out because there's already been enough of that, but this, this episode okay. is a pretty solid one, and that's at the it's episode ninety one of Sam Harris's Waking Up podcast at okay. a minute uh, or one hour and forty eight minutes. Right. If you could post the link, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I enjoyed it, guys. I, I mentioned right. though. Okay. okay. I like your calls. Nice Bye-bye. meeting you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank nice you, you, Doug. Glad you can make it. Hope to see you again soon. Definitely. Ta ta. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I wanted to add a point uh, before we uh, close. Uh, and that's to, oh, Doug, you're still there, but that's to, you don't have to uh, stick around, but that's to the idea, the, the, um, the reference to the population of men, 20 to 40 or so, without a real <clears throat> sense of purpose in, in their lives. Uh, large cultural swaths of that and, and the, the connection between that and addiction between mm-hmm. their polit- political views even political activism uh, i think from a sociological point of view it's it's quite a dangerous um mm-hmm. phenomenon actually i mean because these are really the age of the men who go to war that's mm-hmm. that's really the population base for you know any kind of larger scale aggression so when you don't have, or when the society can't provide pathways, you know, for men to find purpose and meaning, uh, it, it really leaves it vulnerable to these um, uh, destructive expressions. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know, how, I don't want to really talk that much more about that right now, but I think it's worth no- noting. It is. Great. And I think I probably connected to this, Besides the larger cultural crisis and you know, civilization crisis, ultimately, uh, which you know is also a crisis of consciousness, a cri- crisis of the mental structure of consciousness itself, there, there's also a crisis in families, a crisis in parenting. Uh, one of the things that D- Doug mentioned earlier was we talked about kids and their indoctrination into time, into mm-hmm. time structures. If that doesn't happen well, you're really fucking up somebody's neurology at a very, very <laughs> fundamental early stage of development. And I, I think that in our in our culture, American, Western, you know, European civilization, although the Nordic countries are getting beyond this, we force our kids to grow up too fast, and mm-hmm. we force them into higher mental patterns and tempos of consciousness that are not appropriate for their developmental progress. And schools, of course, are the, you know, the institutional expression. This is how it's effectuated, but it ends up being part of our parent, you know, parenting psychology as well. When we have schedules to keep up with and uh, activities to manage and, uh, and we have to make sure that our kids are prepared 
mm-hmm. uh, for the world, the economy, or you know their their future. And we do them, I think, a, a disservice by not letting them exist in the timeless as long as possible because yeah. that's really a, a wonderful place to be, and it's where so much learning happens. And if, if we don't do that learning when we're two, three, four, five years old, um, it's very hard to do it later, and it it takes you know read. Um, re- un- deconstructing your entire life practically, mm-hmm. you know, to recover that openness, that ground. Uh, so real life uh, applications of this, I think are um, abound and uh, we could, you know, educational parenting philosophy. Um, it's nested, mm-hmm. nested amongst con- between contexts, uh, which makes it a really essential and fundamental, I think, issue. So that's what, what I wanted to add. No. Can I? Yeah, please. Can I add something to that? I also had a question for you. I know we might we're probably running out of time, um, but you mentioned something about what was that post-constructivist view hmm. at the end of last call. I think that was one of the things you said you wanted to work out. I was wondering if you've made any progress there, because um, I'm not sure exactly what you meant by post-constructivist. I mean, I've have a pretty good idea, but but then you may have a, a unique way of thinking about that. Um, so I think that's just something that I was interested in finding out about if you've explored any of that further. And also, but before you answer that, I just wanted to show you, uh, this is a quote from The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming by um, Rory McSweeney. He's a, he's, a, he's a dentist, actually. He's also a martial artist, and he does lucid dreaming. Um, and he's written a very interesting book on the fi- on physics. How does he extract teeth, John? <laughs> <laughs> I wish he was living. I wish he lived in New York. I would love. To- I need a good dentist who can <laughs> lose a dream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I might want to learn it for that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. But he had a fascinating. Uh, he has some fascinating experiments that he's conducted, and um, I think that. Uh, uh, Arthur Young, if he was still around, because he, he talks a lot about dreaming and, and part of the book that I thought, and I just was reading about Arthur Young's look on the seventh stage and, and dreaming. He doesn't talk about lucid dreaming, but anyway, this is a quote from the paradox of lucid dreaming. The notion that we cannot experience the strange world of uncertainty and all of its implications is one I would like to challenge with my own personal encounters in the dream world. I have walked through walls, traveled through time, and turned my mind inside out, all because I was aware that I was the observer and the object at the same time. Lucid dreaming may be the bridge that science is seeking, the one that will take us to the promised land where fact and fiction can finally merge. The paradox of the dreamer is that there is no dream without the dreamer, much as there is no dreamer without the dream. The one implies the other. Can we think of matter in a similar fashion? We may soon discover that we cannot separate the subject from the object. The world that was once thought of as being all around us may actually be just as much inside our minds. <clears throat> I think that's a very uh, interesting quote. That and uh, Chris Stephen Rosen, the the philosopher who works with the top what he calls topo dimensional becoming, and working with the the Klein bottle and the Taurus and um, the Moby Strip. Uh, I, I think he's he talks about the proprioceptive capacity. In other words, rather than being out there, subject object grid, you start turning that around into the and start exploring the observer mm. proprioceptively, and you can go back to previous stages of one's development. We can regress in the service of transcendence. Mm. And I think that uh, Rory Sweeney is really marking that out too, that the subject and the object begin to, that grid begins to break down. And, and I believe this may have something to do with the post-constructive um, that you may have brought up. Mm-hmm. Um, this would be my version of what, what would the integral be. Uh, it wouldn't be better than, it would be in some ways more than, um, It'd certainly be different then. And it would be much more a much more proprioceptively attuned individual. Mm. So we could go out there, but we can go inside 
and we can harmonize along now with all of this uh, innovation that's going on out there. This mm. is my uh, hope for what a, a post-constructivist view might be. But mm. then you have, I'm very interested in what others, how they fill in the gaps there, because I'm still working on this myself. Well, how about I try to respond to that, uh, and then we could, uh, you know, Ed, Ed, if you'd like to reply to, to my reply, and then John, maybe you could wrap it, wrap it up. When I referred to uh, post-constructivism, I was thinking about a sort of progression of intellectual discourse from, you might, might say, a naive realism to a constructivism, which is able to see the ways in which reality or our perception of reality are structured by social agreements, by you know, any number of different forms that present to us the reality in the way that we experience it. So once we become aware of those structures, uh, we're able to criticize them, question them, and even you know, attempt to reconstruct them, rearrange them. Uh, but it requires an awareness of them. Uh, and part of what I think historically ha- occurs or has occurred in the in intellectual discourse, philosophical discourse, I mean, particularly in the humanities and philosophy, uh, and uh, maybe l- less so in the sciences, is uh, a sort of extreme, uh, uh, taking that insight to an extreme where uh, you lose uh, a sense of what can't be mentally reconstructed exactly, like what pre- precedes or is prior to or is foundational to the mental models and maps. So when, when we think, when we say that integral is not out there, it's not the next thing, it's not the higher wavelength, or it's not the more complex structure, it's not the better map, it's because it's not another mental phenomena. Like the mental can, is exhausted and, or it's not that it's exhausted, but that it's, it's seen through, as, as Gabeser says. So the transparency is a quality that, we, that uh, uh, emerges in relation to phenomena and the way that phenomena are structured. So we can see through it, but that doesn't mean that we are beyond it. Mm-hmm. And I think that what you're talking about, John, the proprioceptive and the inwardly, like sort of inwardly, outwardly attuned, the, the sense that we can feel as structures arise, as conceptions arise, as mental models and the mappings between them arise, that they're taking place not just in a mental space, but in an embodied and physical and alive space. And that we're seeing that through our, and you always bring attention back to this, where is it in your body? Where is that map? Where is that mapping in your body? That's another kind of thing that's qualitatively different than a more complex model. It's another way of being because we're not being th- in, through the proxy of a mental model. The mental model is within us, and we're simply being ourselves as the beings that we are. That's self-arising, right? So I think that that's kind of what I mean, or what I, the, where I've come to with the idea of a post-constructive view. But I was also loosely correlating it with post-structuralist or sort of post-postmodern uh, Meta modern, these different w- labels for, I think what is not just a model. It's not just a map. It's it's a it's a lived experience, and it's something that we deepen into through our intention practice, and also just through grace, because like we arise as we arise, really before we are able to cognize. Uh, who, I call that serendipity. <laughs> Yeah, serendipity. It's just like comes out of nowhere, but it doesn't come out of anywhere. It comes out of your your prepared mind. Yes, you'll notice it. An unprepared mind won't notice it at all. That's so right. I think we are very much participating in this. I think so too. It's uh, interesting and it's scary sometimes too because the, it is a like Ed, you've been pointing out if you're beginning to mm, turn inside out and your beliefs are loosening 
Like they're 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 becoming de 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 reified. Mm -hmm. uh, who you th think you are, what you think you believe, or what you think is true, uh, begins to dissolve. It does. Mm -hmm. It's not, and that's exciting, but it, it it's also scary. It's scary. Uh, mm -hmm. It's scary at a cultural level, civilizational level. It's scary at a personal level. Uh, it's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> don't go there unless you have to. You know, well, we and all some do, of us yeah. have to. We don't have much of a choice. You know? That's I mean, the thing. I mean, we're we're almost forced to by circumstances. Yeah. You know, because if you don't have another exit, and you also maybe see the limit, the limitations of certain kinds of regression, like you can't go back to patriotism. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, or nationalism. You can't go back to structures that were previously sufficient because right. you see through them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to make a comment too about the, the Me Too and the sexual harassment discourses. You know, there's something too mythologically that seems to be going on and this uh, notion of, of a reckoning, of a judgment day, mm -hmm. they're, they're maybe not so different than what Gibson meant by transparency. And the, there, there is a sense in which what seems to be happening now is we're seeing through and what's, what was behind closed doors and behind curtains and hidden and suppressed and um, uh, ignored is, is coming to the surface and we're, we're beginning to see through the, you know, the illusions. <laughs> It's, it's so hard. It's so painful. I mean, my mother, I saw my, my father beat the shit out of my mother. He beat the shit out of me. My mother beat us up too, but it was very different to see a mother get hit. And my brothers, you know, they're married, have children. And they've told me, and I believe them, and I know their kids. They've never hit their wives. They don't hit their kids. And why is it that some men see that behavior and adopt it, and some men are repulsed by it. That's a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. My father was a very sick person, but I think he's, um, you know, he's dead and gone and I bless him. He taught me a lot about being resilient. And I think a lot of these men, it's, you know, the lover archetype, the downside, the shadow side of the lover is um, addiction, um, getting lost in the other person. And a lot of the, you know, I think these, uh, these addictive side of the lover archetype is probably what a lot of these men who perpetuate these injustices are caught up in. I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's, it puzzles me, but I'm also um, very aware that at a very young age, when I could stop that behavior, I did. And I stood up that, I stood up to him and uh, he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I hit him back, he stopped. It's amazing. You mm -hmm. smack one of these bullies, they crumble. But that was a tough lesson for me because he was my father. So I loved him and I hated him at the same time. And I think that's something that we're gonna have to come to terms with. It's a paradox, it's a deep paradox. But I think the mature, um, the mature masculine is able to hold these paradoxes rather than become unglued by them um, and start fighting or being belligerent or, or getting power over others. <clears throat> Not that women can't do that too, because they can. <laughs> I think I wrote about that, that I've been, I was, in a, I was sexually harassed by a woman. And it was very tricky. And I learned something very important about, about that. I feel a lot of solidarity with, with a lot of women's complaints that I hadn't felt before in a very personal, visceral way. So I think we're going through a tremendous purging, actually. I just hope it doesn't happen too fast, um, because then the backlash will be very intense. Mm -hmm. um, because these whistleblowers, the people who are whistleblowing now, I think they're doing it collectively, so it's very powerful. But there were a lot of whistleblowers that came before them who were silenced mm -hmm. and who lost their jobs and, or, and who were put away. So I'm thinking that, you know, enough people are coming together and blowing whistles. It's powerful. I think that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, 
how are we going to heal these splits? I'm not sure. Because these men are psychologically, I think, very, uh, very young and very regressed in a, in a, in a way that is not serving transcendence. I think that's, that's tricky to know when, when the regression is a healthy one or not. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a, that's a very deep issue for us. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with the diagnosis, and I, I agree with, with, with Marco on this point. I was in intelligence when I was in the military. Everything was secret. Everything was classified. Nobody could know anything. Power resided in exclusion from, from others and whatnot. But it, it's also the most ludicrous um, undertaking that we've ever come up with, intelligence. You know, military intelligence is the oxymoron par excellence because it's all about trying to hide things that, first of all, don't need to be hide, hide, uh, hid. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes from when I was working here in uh, Bad Ersfeld, my army days, we would have to do, li I did liaison with all of the uh, government agencies in the area, and one of them was the, the Customs and the Border Police. And there was a rail crossing up in uh, Babra, so, and it was one of two places where trains came out of the eastern zone. And so they could only go across the border there, and the trains would come out of the east, and, and when they were over here, the Customs and the, the Border Police people would go through the trains, and it was you know, people in the East are like people in the West. They just leave their trash laying around. And so they were reading the newspaper. They left it lying on the seat. And they, so they would pick these up and collect them because they knew the Americans would show up and they would have something to give them. And so we, we would go home with these little trinkets all the time. And so I would get these newspapers from uh, East Germany, taken back to the office. And my job, once I got back there, was to open this newspaper, take my secret stamp, stamp the top and the bottom of every page of this publicly pr printed newspaper from the East, fold it up, write a cover letter, report, put it on it, wrap this thing up so that it couldn't be tampered with so that I could mail it to our headquarters, who would mail it to Heidelberg, who would mail it to Munich, where there was a whole battalion of translators who would sit down and translate these articles and put them into briefs that they would send back up the chain to Heidelberg. Well, this is, this is publicly printed stuff, and it's now going through a declassification. These things are just now becoming declassified for official use only. This was all stuff that was written in the newspaper. Wow. Yes. And <laughs> so the absurdity of trying to hide things that are there is just beyond belief. And we've come to the point – and this really struck me, actually, for the first time, because I was dealing with Gabe so very intensely about the time that the uh, Monica Lewinsky and the impeachment with Clinton came up and whatnot. And it was just very clear to me, you can't, we can't hide things anymore. Right. There was a time where that was very effective. It was still possible, John. And, and so where it was possible, right. it was done. But right. you can try as hard as you want. You can't keep it hidden anymore. And You're going to be on the 5 o'clock news. Everyone's going to it's, see it. <laughs> it's going to be out there. It's simply yes. going to be there. Learn to, you're going to have to learn to live with it because you can't hide it anymore. But here's where I think that Sloterdijk is useful because mm -hmm. he'll make the connection, for example, between, this, between these different kind of spheres of existence. The theological sphere, for example, the notion that God is aware of everything that we do, that God that we can't hide from God. Like that idea is already planted and it takes a certain shape. And now here we are, you know, at the end of history and we're basically experiencing the same thing, but it's not God, it's the media and surveillance and each other and the, the, the hypersphere, you know, that we've created, which is enabling this kind of radical transparency where really um, we're talking right now, I have a camera on my, on my mm -hmm. computer. I don't know that, Somebody hasn't hacked my computer and is watching whatever I do, like whenever I do it. I don't know that I, there, there aren't. Men are watching you now. Well, I, I don't know that there, there don't already exist uh, high, extremely sophisticated surveillance technologies, nanobots the size of amoebas or something like that, that are watching every single thing I do. And maybe it's not the NSA. Maybe it's a future uh, Leviathan 
you know, that is surveilling the past to, I mean, this is the kind of thing that Michael was getting into these, yes. these you know, insane uh, speculative possibilities, let's say, but epistemologically, I don't know. And if yeah. I don't really know, then my best course of action is to comport myself ethically, whether somebody's watching or not. Watching, you know. right. Integrity is what you do when no one's watching. But that's tough because you don't always know what the right thing is. Mm -hmm. In the moment, you have to make choices. Yes. And you may reflect on that and say, that was a bad choice. <laughs> and oh, I'll no. learn something from it, hopefully. There you go, John. That's called learning. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a t but it doesn't mean you have a code of ethics and you figured it all out. And That's you correct. Step into a situation and your code of ethics is going to support you. It doesn't work that way. If someone's sexually harassing you and it's in secret and they're, they set in all, into motion all kinds of configurations that are, you know, you don't know what the right thing to do is. You don't know who this person is talking to. Is this a person of power who can talk to somebody else who could, you could get fired or some other repercussions. So you may collude. And that may be the best thing to do. You may not. You may fight. Or sometimes I've also spoken up for others mm -hmm. who were in an abuse. Some abuse was happening. I've blown the whistle. I got fired. They all kept their jobs. Mm -hmm. But because I blew the whistle and I reported it and the authorities were alerted to it, they all got a raise. Mm -hmm. I was on unemployment line. Yeah. So I had to learn, you know what? It's not always the best thing to articulate somebody else's grievances for them on their behalf. That was a hard one for me to learn. Anyway, I'm just saying wow. Wow. it's not, it, it's not that easy. Yeah. You nope. just sort of, it's, and it's getting harder and harder, I think, because we, many of us have met so many m multiple moral codes circulating in any system. You don't know who you're going to offend by what kind of behavior. Um, and so something you may intend it as a joke doesn't come off that way. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard one or who you disclose something to. And then you find out later, Oh, they're not to be trusted. And, uh, it's, it's tricky. Mm. And sometimes I don't want to know things. I've had people tell me, Oh, I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anybody else. And I say, I don't want to hear it. Mm. Because if you're going to tell me something that I feel like I know something that, that's going mm -hmm. to violate somebody else's situation, and I'm going to have to keep that your secret for you. I'm not interested. Yeah. Hmm. That's a I tough. Tell others, John. Don't tell me anything. I ain't no refrigerator. I can't keep <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and tell me anything you want to, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, going to, gonna, I'm going to write a story. Get out, and I can tell you where you can come to look for it, you guys. <laughs> I'm going to. I'll screw it up. I, <laughs> I know me well enough. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. But you're right, John. It is, it's a, it is a challenge. And it's one where, you know, continually face. You always have to do the best you can at the time. Right. But acknowledging that that wasn't the good thing and learning from it. You know, I'm a big fan of, to me, there's only two kinds of learning experiences in life. Aha. Uh -huh, you get it? And oh, shit. And we do that a lot. Right. But if you learn from them, well, that's what you do. Yeah. So. These are these, these binds and double binds. Yeah. And, and triple binds. Yeah. Um, how we how we work with this, I think it's it's really a, a very big challenge. Hmm. For sure, well, you've left me with food for thought. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this is the cafe where where you leave hungry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you leave hungry for more more, th more thought. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I, uh, I I point well taken though, John. Uh, it's not always clear what to do, uh, and uh, to sincerely struggle with with the question, I think, is um, sometimes the most you can hope to do. Uh, right. I agree. I agree. And That's you know. Right. I'm going to keep thinking about this. I, I, I'm a bit at a loss for words right now. Please do, and write write it up on online. We'll, we can talk about it. Okay. I've really Good. enjoyed the. Uh, I've really enjoyed that that interplay between the the live conversations and the the group I, effort. To yeah, I do as well. Share stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Okay. Uh,
been fun. Oh gosh, I feel no. I, I really feel like there's something left to say, and I, 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 I think it's to just this last point, um, and this sort of reckoning, and this this no, this notion of transparency, because, jeez, uh, I mean, everything has to come out in the wash eventually, doesn't it? Yeah. And and the learning is is. Uh, I mean, it, maybe not in this life, even maybe just as a psychological seed that like karmically reappears later in some mysterious way. I, I can't imagine that any, anything that is done, whether, whether secret or not, is ever f- fully lost to the universe, that somehow it, any process that's initiated has to play itself out. Right. And I'm, so we're kind of totally. caught in that. We're caught in these processes playing themselves out. Right, and they're oh, intergenerational. Wow. Many mm-hmm. generations have created these oh, yeah. these conditions, and uh, we're gonna and we're kicking things down the road that we're not gonna deal with. The next generation after us is gonna have to. So this is, uh, but I think that if there are enough people in each generation who've said enough, I'm not gonna hit my kids. I'm not gonna hit my wife. We're making progress. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the children and everyone's gonna benefit from that. So, yeah, I think so too. And I mean, it takes some decision. That's why that quantum of action that Arthur Young talks mm-hmm. about was, I thought it was such a significant concept that that's one thing that I'm, that I've really taken away from this one amongst numerous mm-hmm. points that I've taken away from the last conversations. Last thing that I definitely want to say before we stop this recording and it becomes part of history mm-hmm. is that because we're all in a learning process and because our own actions are arising most of the time out of past actions, not, not just our own in the sort of personally identifiable sense. We have to allow each other to make mistakes and we have to allow each other to learn. Right. And mm-hmm. if we look at, the, I mean, what is perhaps troubling, if there's a shadow side to this reckoning process, and this sort of radical transparency is that we, is that we can call things out, right? And we can shed light. But then the question is, how do you reintegrate and how do you rehabilitate and what's learned by the individuals, both the perpetrators, victims, predator, prey, by the culture in the sense of our shared media. And I'm not sure that that, when I hear news about the next, you know, Charlie Rose or whoever it is. I mean, it's always every day there's multiple, right? New revelations and they have to come out. I'm, I just wonder whether we have the cult, the cultural capacity for a learning process. Right. A, a, a forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's going to, and I think there are a lot of mature women who, who are, who are, who've set some of the stage for that, but you have to come clean before you can start to forgive. And you can't, you can't negotiate in a violent situation. Mm-hmm. Someone's throwing a rock at your head. You can't say, listen, I know you have a, you know, you some you terrible right. grievance that you're trying to work out. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you stop them, you yeah. know? And I think that's what we're, we're, we're in the middle of, we're in the transition zone here mm-hmm. and it's very hard to sort it out. Um, but we do have models and I think um, it's, it's very important but it's it's painful sometimes. I think we we got a lot. Of, we know a lot more about post traumatic stress than we have, mm-hmm. and there are there are ways I think to renegotiate this physiologically. Uh, I've had some very good success using clean language on my own PST. On my and I worked with another person, and I'd been through lots of therapy. Didn't it mm-hmm. actually made it much worse? But clean language, symbolic modeling, these are techniques, and I'm I'm a great believer in good techniques <laughs> rather than bad ones. And I think there are a lot of good ones out there, uh, and um, I believe there are ways we can um, we can reorganize the nervous system so that we don't uh, habitually reenact these the, these these yeah. violent behaviors that we learned usually when we were very young, when we ourselves were being violated, and we identified with that one who was violating us, and we checked out. We weren't there. And we identified with them. So we either grow up punishing ourselves, getting into some sort of trouble, mm-hmm. or we say, oh, wait a minute, you know, I feel this feeling. I feel, I feel lost, helpless. What, what am I going to do with that? Can I pay attention to it? Rather than go out there 
get a bottle or go out and find somebody to go have sex with or go buy mm-hmm. something. You just stay with that feeling and then start to re- regress. You have to sometimes go back to those earlier portions of your of, of yourself. And then you can find a way of releasing that from your nervous system. But it's not easy. And sometimes you need guidance to do it. These are lessons that I did not want to learn. They were forced upon me by circumstances because a, a lot of my life was just grinding to a halt. And I realized, you know what? I have to deal with this shit. And I'm just going to have to deal with it. And I think a lot of people are, are realizing that on a large scale, uh, that, um, that uh, these dysfunctional patterns, we, we, we got to find a way of clearing them helping each other, supporting each other. We can forgive, but we can't afford to forget. <laughs> and I think that's the, that's the dilemma. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end, mm-hmm. end the discussion. So yeah, I'll uh, be posting this to the forum. Good. And um, I'll be here next week for anyone Great. to come yeah. back. All right. Uh, looking so, forward to it. Thank uh, you. So thank you so much. Thanks right. to Doug. Thank you. Here as well. Right. Ed, John, thanks, Ed. thanks Marco. Thank nice you. Hang in there. Be hang good. in there. Talk to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. See you online. <laughs>